Shalom. This week's portion is Behala Otecha. In your making going up. Numbers 8 1 through 12 16. The Haftarah portion is Zechariah 2 14 through 4 7. And the Apostolic Scripture portion is Revelation 21 1 through 8. The introduction. Once the tabernacle is built, a cloud hovers over it by day and fire by night. The cloud moves as a sign that God wants the Israelites to proceed. So they march whenever the cloud moves forward, and they camp whenever the cloud settles down. Numbers 10, 34 through 36. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. So it was whenever the ark set out that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. So we know that the presence of God was with the Israelites, at least in the beginning. And I would have to say that the presence of God was also with the Israelites, even after they sinned in the wilderness, he just kind of distanced himself a little bit from them. Instead of dwelling in the midst of the camp, he moved himself to the outside of the camp, because he refused to dwell in the midst of Israel, because he wouldn't dwell in the midst of the sin. And, yeah, you could list that, you know, the Torah talks about a multitude of different sins that are listed in there and everything. But for me, when it comes down to it, the ones, it, it all comes from one sin, and that sin is disobedience. It's not doing what God wants you to do. It's not doing what God instructed you to do. It's knowing what God wants you to do and refusing to do what God wants you to do. So, you know, you can talk about a God of love and everything else and all of this, and you always have to remember God's balanced. So on the one side, there's love and there's mercy and all that, and on the other side, I'll just be nice about it and I'll say it's discipline. Okay? And there's different forms of discipline that God uses, but God will do that. Because there's love on the other so he's a loving father who must look out for his children. And he might have to discipline his children from time to time. A lot of us should know that in our own lives, that if, something, if we don't do something that's correct and we know that we've done something that was wrong, we should be ready for what's going to be coming. Because once you disobey God, God loves you and he'll still forgive you, but he still will discipline you. He has to. He has no alternative for that. You know, he's not going to shut you out of the kingdom. He won't do that. He'll allow you to come in if you're doing your best to get back on track again. The Israelites in the wilderness, the generation that came up out of Egypt that were 20 years of age and up, they just seemed to keep going up and down, up and down. And then it got to a point where they're going down, 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 down. It got so bad that God finally said that no one of that generation was going to enter into the promised land except for two people. And those two people were Caleb and Joshua. So you need to keep that in mind when you come to that. And it's always interesting when you talk about that. Nobody really focuses on Caleb that much, but more people focus on Joshua. The interesting thing about it is, is that Caleb is associated with the tribe of Judah. Joshua is associated with the tribe of Ephraim. And it's interesting because there's more than enough scriptural proof in scripture to show you that God has two kingdoms that he's dealing with at the present time. He's dealing with Judah and Ephraim. And a lot of people want to talk, well, that's the two houses of Israel, and that's divisive, and blah, 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 and all of this, and it's all of that and everything for that. It is what it is in the Bible. You can fight about it all you want in this physical world, but in God's world, everything's been settled, everything's been taken care of. We're just still working it out here, and God split Israel in two. Well, actually, he made it an 80-20 split. Okay? He sent 80% into the northern kingdom, and he kept 20% in the southern. In other words, he kept two. Two tribes. But, as usually goes along with that, added to that two tribes 
were the remnant of some of the people who migrated down from the northern tribes, particularly the tribe of Levi, who came down. It's also believed that the tribe of Simeon, for the most part, they came and also associated themselves with the southern tribes. We do know from reading scripture, from looking in Chronicles and the other books that are in there, that there were other people from the northern tribes that migrated down and became part of Judah. They're there today. They're even recognized by Orthodox Jews today. The Orthodox Jews say that Ephraim must come back as one of the signs for the Messiah to come. They're not going to tell you that the Messiah is going to return because they don't believe that he's already come the first time. They're still looking for the first coming. I keep saying that when he comes, they're going to be kind of surprised that it's the same guy who came the first time. And I believe they're going to recognize him because in Scripture they're very clear about that. Not only will Judah recognize them, but so will everybody else. But the thing about it is, is that not everybody's going to accept him. They will see him, they will recognize him, but they will reject him. That's how hard they make their hearts. You think about that. That's pretty amazing when you think about it here. He's coming back on the clouds the way that he left. He's going to be coming down to the earth. He's going to have an army behind him. Okay? And people are still going to reject him. You know it's going to be on all the cable news. <laughs> you know it's going to be on all the TV sets and everything. That's either that or they're all going to go into a blackout. Because they don't want to show you what's going on. Yep. Because nobody really wants to accept that. But there's no way to get around what the Messiah is going to do. It's all prophesied in Scripture. It's all there. But in God's realm, it's all been worked out already. There's a difference between a spiritual world and a physical world. A spiritual world is not bound by time. The physical world is bound by time. So we're still working things out here. How long will it take? I have no idea how long is it going to take. But I can tell you right now the way that the world's going, if we're not beginning to get into the end times or the last days, I don't know what is out there. Because this world is getting topsy-turvy. This world is flipping around like a dead fish without, you know, out of water. Doesn't know what to do with itself until finally there's nothing left if somebody kicks it back into the water. God may be kicking us back into the water for, you know, let it, us hang on a little bit more as he's dangling us out there a little bit. But here, Israel has God's presence with them throughout their wanderings in the wilderness. And it's interesting when we hear about, you know, we always hear about the cloud over them during the day and the fire at night. So they had warmth at night and they had shelter from the sun during the day. But they knew that that was God's presence that was with them. So this is what's believed to have been there in the cloud and in the fire, that it was God's presence. Some people call it the Shekinah or the Shekinah which is God's presence. But what is God's presence? What does it mean to be God's presence? There's a lot of different definitions for that, but you can also associate that with God's glory. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is something. Something that's totally different than anything that we understand. It's so different that even Moses was not allowed to look upon the face of God when he asked to look upon God's face. God told him, all he could see was his back. He could look upon his back because no man could look upon God's face and live. I would believe that when Messiah returns and once everything is taken care of and everything is set and the Father comes down to the earth also to reign with his Son from the new Jerusalem, that we're told that the glory of the Lord is going to be so great there will be no need of the sun and the moon and the stars in the new Jerusalem because it will be lit 24-7 by God's presence, by His glory. I would have to think that we should be able to come into His presence at that point in time. I would hope that we would be able to see the Father in some form. The Father is believed to be or 
you know, spirit, pure spirit, that we can't see for whatever reason. Moses encountered God in the burning bush. Remember, he saw a bush on fire, but it was not being consumed. He kind of scratched his head at that. Well, you know, today that's nothing. Technical effects, computer stuff. All that can give you all the burning bushes that you want. Anything that you want, you can get today. You can do it all on, you know, the small screen. Just stand in front of a green screen and you can get whatever you want. No problem. God doesn't work that way. God works in the reality of what is here now because He controls everything. He lets it play itself out because He has taken a step back from interfering in what's happening on this earth because He has to see His plan come to fruition. It has to work itself out. So what's our part in all this? Our part in all of this is to make sure that we're doing our best to follow God and to follow his Torah, and to be faithful to his Messiah, to his Son. Because you cannot come into the presence of the Father except through the Son. It's through the Son that we receive redemption. Now, everybody wants to tell you that uh, Messiah came 2,000 years ago, he died, he was resurrected, and everything is finished. Everything is done now. We're just waiting for everything to play itself out. Well, I'm sorry to tell these people that they are full of baloney. To be nice. Because everything hasn't played itself out yet. You know why? Because for those of us that understand the biblical festivals, we know that God still has one half of his plan to come to fruition yet. Because the fall festivals have not been fulfilled. The spring festivals have. So we still have Yom Teruah. We still have Yom Kippur. We still have Sukkot. And we still have Shemini Azrazet. Now a lot of people don't understand that there's a difference between Sukkot and Shemini Azrazet. That's because on a Jewish calendar, you will see Shemini Azrazet on a Jewish calendar. But for the most part, most Jews put it all together into Sukkot. And they call it the eight days of Sukkot. That's not biblically accurate. Because in the Bible, Sukkot is only a seven day festival. Shemini Azrazet is the eighth day and it's separate. It's separate from that. It's another festival that comes right on the heels of Sukkot. And it all has biblical significance. All prophetic you know, foundation in it all. It's just more than what people understand today. Because you can't just, you know, yeah, okay, Yeshua came. He died, he was resurrected. If we all accept him, we're all saved. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let's get on with our lives. It's not what God expects from you. God expects from you to live out that redemption every single day that we're still here. You can't go back on it. You can't turn your back on it. Because God will hold you accountable for that. In Psalm 68.1 To the chief musician, a psalm of David, a song. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the present of God. So David writes the same thing that Moses did. So I would have to assume that David at least read some parts of the Torah before he fell into sin, big time sin. Sin that was so bad that his family got torn apart in many different ways as he was trying to resolve things, but the reality of King David was is that he showed us the problems that we encounter every single day in our lives. And the fact that sometimes you just simply forget about God. And we all have to admit the reality that there are times that things take our eyes off of the Lord. But as soon as we remember, we need to go back to God and ask for His forgiveness and ask for Him to draw us even closer to Him so that we can continue on 
and I'll walk with him. So it's not a matter that you're always going to be right with God. It's a matter that it's a work in progress. In Psalm 132, 8, it says, Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. So once again, David is talking about the Lord, and he's telling him to go to his resting place with his ark. What is the ark? The ark of the covenant. It's the ark where there are three things that are supposed to be inside of it. The two stone tablets, the rod that, Aaron's, that Aaron had that budded, and a jar of manna. That's what is supposed to be inside the ark of the covenant. Jewish writings say that the two stone tablets that Moses broke are also inside of there. We're not told that in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. If you want to accept that because the rabbi said so, God bless you, go for it. I can't tell you what to do or that, but I can tell you this, that the rabbis don't take the place of the scripture. They don't take the place of the written word of God. They claim to be following the oral Torah of God. But if you really look closely at the things that they follow, it's not as simple as they make it out to be because they follow other books besides that. And those books are not included in the Talmud. And in the Talmud is where you have the Mishnah and the Gemara. And it's those works in there that they place their foundation for their belief on because they believe that those books give them the authority to interpret the Torah the way that they see fit. God didn't give us that right to do that. The only one that could do that that we're aware of was Moses. And I believe that before Moses did anything underneath of his own accord, he made sure he ran it by the boss. Because Moses was in a constant relationship with God. Except for one time. The time that he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And he paid a big penalty for that. Zechariah 2, 10 through 13. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land. And will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. For he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. The Lord promises that the day is coming when he's going to return. When he's going to come back. And he says that he will dwell in the midst of Israel again. So that means he's going to bring Israel back together. He's going to reunite them into one people instead of being divided. Instead of being broken, not into just two parts, but into all the twelve tribes of Israel. He's going to bring them all back together and unite them and make them one again. And he's going to do that, I believe, in the latter days. And he says, And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. How will they be able to be his people if there are other nations that are after? Because God only made a covenant with one nation. He only made a covenant with Israel. He made a covenant with physical Israel. Almost 3,500 years ago. He made a covenant with them and you cannot replace that. You cannot claim a physical Israel and a spiritual Israel. It doesn't work. There's only one Israel and in that Israel is both the physical and the spiritual. And God deals with that Israel. He deals with the nations as they are outside of Israel. He gives them the opportunity to be able to come into and join his people. It doesn't mean you have to convert to anything. That's man's work. Men tell you you have to convert. God tells you just give yourselves over to me. 
Because depending on the system that you convert to, as we've discussed many times here before, it can take you from one year to seven years. It can take you one day, depending on who you pay to help you do it, and all of that. It can be a dragged out process. And what's the use of the process? You know, what are people trying to teach you? They need to teach you how to have a relationship with your Creator. That's the bottom line, and that's the most important thing that we have to remember. We need to have a relationship with the God who created us. Through His Son, Yeshua the Messiah, He was the vessel through whom God worked in order to bring us into existence. And He says in the Word, He tells us that He created them through Him and for Him. Kind of makes you think that we're Yeshua's playthings. He said he made us through him and for him. You know, he takes us out of the box when he wants to play with us, and then when we're bad, he puts us back in the box, and he doesn't want to play. He puts us back in the closet again. And he goes and he picks up another box of the people that he wants to have a relationship with and all of that. He constantly wants a relationship with us. He wants an ongoing relationship, and he wants people who are committed to him, who are not going to one day be for him and the next day be against him. Or who will deny them in the times of trial. God tells us he will test us. We will go through trials. We will go through tribulation. That's what he told us. That's what he's going to do. And we need to remember that. We need to keep us in our minds. And in our hearts. And we need to bury it away. And we need to hold on to that promise. So we can be prepared for the day of testing. Because a lot of people are going to be surprised when they're tested because they believe that once they accept Yeshua as their Messiah and Savior that everything is hunky-dory and it's fine and everything's going to go along smoothly. And there will no longer be any problems in their lives. That's not true. And God doesn't hide that from us in Scripture. It's there. Open up your Bibles and read it. And you'll find it there. In Isaiah 12, 6, it says, Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So what's Zion? Zion is a lot of times the equivalent of Jerusalem. Sometimes it's the equivalent of Israel. So are we living in Zion? Are we inhabiting Israel? Are we inhabiting Jerusalem? Are we supposed to do that right now? Well, they're in such a turmoil today over there that only about 10% of the population in Israel that are Jewish are observant. The rest of the Jewish population is secular for the most part or are very less observant on the other hand for that. I mean, I just saw on the news yesterday, I read a news thing yesterday that I think it was God, how many thousands of people were there? There was a gay pride march in Tel Aviv. And there were thousands of people that were present for it. In the promised land. I don't think Tel Aviv is one of the promised cities. And Tel Aviv could be a resurrection of one of the cities that God destroyed before. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah just doesn't, you know, apply to the two cities that were there that God destroyed way back when. The Sodom and Gomorrah can be anywhere today on the face of the earth. You can see it all over. But as the reality is, do we accept it? Do we have to live with it? Yeah, we have to live with it depending on where we live because the laws of the countries that we live in forbid us from doing other things about that. And maybe that's why God continues to pull his hand back from us because we're not doing what he wants us to do. But are we supposed to do that? Doesn't the Apostle Paul also write in his writings that we are to obey the laws of the countries that we live in? So we are citizens here in the United States and we have laws here that are put in place by Federal government, state governments, local governments. There's a lot of bad laws. We have to admit we, we have to admit that. Most of Congress is made up of lawyers and we know what God has to say about lawyers. 
I didn't say that. It's in the Bible. It is in the Bible. It says in there that woe unto you, lawyer. Mm hmm. Hmm? Their lips are moving, they're lying. No. Just like the used car salesmen. Used car salesmen are just preparing to be lawyers. Touche. I was going to study to be a lawyer one time. My wife said I should have done it, I would have been good at it. But I wasn't. I didn't follow that down. I went in a different direction. Yeah. Sometimes I'm glad. The way things are today, everybody needs a lawyer now. You all need that. Either that or you just lie and then you just don't worry about it. You know? I mean, how many people really think about the fact when they're told, they said, I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. I wonder if some of them will say, and leave out the last sentence. You know, it, it's, it's interesting when you think about all those different things that, you know, go on out there and what it is, but it happened in Yeshua's day too. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees. Pharisees were lawyers. <laughs> you know, they ran, they, they were the ones that interpreted the Torah. They were the ones that came up with the oral law. They were the ones that wanted the people to do exactly what they told them to do. They weren't telling them to listen to God and look for His voice. They were telling them, listen to us. For we know better than God. It doesn't work that way. Nobody knows better than God. In Isaiah starting chapter 2, verse 2 through 3, and it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that me, we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go, shall go the Torah and the word of the Lord. From Jerusalem. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. I would have to think that if the mountain of the Lord is going to be the highest place eventually on the face of the earth, kind of doesn't jive with the fact that the new Jerusalem is going to come down out of heaven and come down to the earth and settle down here flattening everything that's underneath it. Unless God is going to do some work with the rest of the mountains around the world and is going to lower them down to a level that makes them lower than his mountain. And it's always kind of interesting when you think about it. If you look at pagan practices, a lot of the time pagan practices always want you to go to a high place. They want you to find a high place. To me, that's imitation of what God has told us we're supposed to do. God told us to seek us out on the mountaintops, to seek us out at His mountain. He gave the Torah to the children of Israel from a mountain. He gave it to Moses. He called Moses up on that mountain so many years ago. He had Abraham bring Isaac to a mountain that many believe where Jerusalem was or where the temple was going to be built. So God always calls us up to the high places. Maybe that's why Satan has his servants want them to go up to the high places in imitation of what we do, or what we're supposed to do. We kind of live up in a slightly higher place here. Some of us live up a little bit higher than some of the rest of you here in the Messia Valley. I can't help that, you know, you have to buy up there 
It's God's country. <laughs> Sometime. Someday we won't be able to see the mountains because they're going to probably wind up building homes straight across all of it or a shopping mall. But for now, we can still see the mountains. I live right up there. I live right up by the mountains. You can walk out the front door, you turn around, and you see the mountains smack back right in your face up there. And over the years, you start to take things for granted. And you lose sight of it until you step back and you take the bigger view and you look out your window or something and you see, oh, look where I live, right up there. Because if I think back to when I lived in New Jersey or in Philadelphia, there was no mountains. <laughs> Not unless you call school skyscrapers mountains and maybe some people would from there. Sometimes all you could see was building upon building upon building and home upon home upon home couldn't see anything else. When we first moved down here, my wife wanted to know where all the green was. I says, we got to go up to Cloudcroft in order to see that. Or Rio Doso. I says, two hour drive and we'll be up there. You can see all the green you want. It says, for now, down here, we see all the brown we have. But now we have some green on our property. It only took 20 plus, you know, almost 24 years now to grow that green. But it's there. Still along with the weeds. God really tested my patience with that. Tested my patience by continually bringing weeds back and the thorns in them. You know when you hear about the thorns and the thistles and that Adam in the beginning was able to just go around and just take his fruit off the tree and just do a little landscape work and whatever God wanted to do and then after he fell, God told them, you will work for your food. You will do it by the sweat of your brow and thorns and thistles and everything else. Well, I can testify to the thorns and the thistles. Okay? And for so many years, you know, I don't need to go to a gym to exercise. <laughs> I just grab my hoe and go outside and start hacking away. And it, it feels good at times when you do that. You know, you're out there and you're working and you're doing something instead of just sitting around and wasting away and just waiting for God to come and get you. Maybe God might not come and get you if you're just sitting on your butt and you're not doing anything. You need to get up you need to do something. Otherwise, there's going to be a problem. You know, we need to be sharing about God with everybody whose path we come across when we can. We don't force our beliefs on somebody else because forcing your beliefs on somebody else doesn't do you any good. Because all it does is turn people off. You need to be the example to them of what God wants you to be. And God wants you to love them despite themselves and despite ourselves. And it's hard because God tells us, love God first and then love your neighbor after that. I've got some neighbors I really, I don't, that's really hard. It is not an easy road to hoe, literally. But... God tells you you have to do it, so you got to do it. You got to be, that's in between my mumbling. You know, going... You know, and all that. And I go, Lord, I know, forgive me. It is what it is. It's, I'm a work in progress, people. We all are. In Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither now shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, 
And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That, he's talking about the lake of fire. He's talking about the lake where the anti-Messiah and the false prophet are, and where Satan is going to wind up being. And it tells us that when Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, he's not consumed. He is tormented for the rest of eternity there. So those that are thrown into that lake of fire with him, will they be consumed or will they be tormented eternally? I don't know. People you know, look at different scriptures that are in the Bible and some say, no, God would never do that. That's not a merciful and a loving God. Other people say that, yes, that is a God who has to be just and balanced and he must do what he said he was going to do. God has no place for sin in his kingdom. And he will do whatever is necessary. But for those who went against God and who broke his Torah, his covenant, and who refused to accept his Messiah or do ill towards his Messiah, and for those who are followers of the Messiah, he has a punishment that fits the crime. And it'll be up to him because it's not up to us to do the judging, it's up to God. Amen. God will do the judging in the end. It's going to be interesting to see what the new heaven and the new earth look like. Will it be a new heaven and a new earth, literally? Will it be a renewed heaven and a new earth? Will God need to have to absolutely have to create something totally new because of the sin that was on this earth for so many millennia? Think of that. That this earth is so foul that God tried to wash it away with water the first time. The second time, he said he's going to burn it all down. Will that purify it? Well, we read in Scripture that things can pass through the fire and be purified when they go through, as long as the impurities are removed. But that doesn't bode well for the way the earth is going to look by the time God gets done with it. But that doesn't mean that God can't fix it. But I don't know. Maybe it will be a new heaven and a new earth. Maybe it's that time after the final battle after Satan is finally defeated, that there's that period of time before we enter into eternity that God will do something to repair this creation. In Isaiah 10.22, For though your people Israel will be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. Romans 9.27 Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Only the remnant will come back. Only the remnant will be saved. It's not a vast multitude of billions of people that God said are going to be saved in the end. He says it will be only a remnant. These two places aren't the only places that we read about it in Scripture. The remnant is spoken about constantly over and over and over again. Israel is a picture of the remnant. God is bringing back His people bit by bit. And there's only a remnant that believe in Messiah. And the re most of the remnant that believes in Messiah doesn't believe in following the Torah. So you know... You can't have one without the other. You can't have Torah without Messiah, and you can't have Messiah without Torah. You can't. you got to have both. They both come together. It makes one unit. It makes one thing. God didn't give His covenant in the beginning to just to toss it out the window because He, you know, he, he did it as a test, and we all failed the test, so God made a better way. God's word cannot go out and not be fulfilled. He will not send it out. I just read that the other day a couple times. 
that God's word cannot go out. It has to be fulfilled. It must be fulfilled once he puts it out there. So God said that Israel are his people, and it's into Israel that everyone becomes grafted in. And Hosea 1.10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. That's our promise. Our promise is to be children of the living God. That's how God always refers to Israel, except he changes the last part. He just calls them the children of Israel. It's because they behave like children. So they behave like children, so he treated them like children. He disciplined them at every turn that was necessary in order to do that. We want to advance. We want to have it said to us, children of the living God. God's people. And I'm going to close with this. Terror man says, others will follow your footsteps more easily than they will follow your advice.